everybody. Welcome to Canadian Critical Minerals in the Electric Revolution. I am Liz Lappin, your moderator. I'm with the Battery Metals Association of Canada, or BMAC, which is an industry association rep representing the whole battery supply chain from raw materials through to end use and recycling. We have a very amazing panel for you today with uh, uh, Gordana Slepchov, Chris Dornbos, Mark Jarvis, and Vincent Dubay Bourgeois. All right, so I'm going to let all of our esteemed panelists, each of whom have product projects in the critical mineral space, introduce themselves one by one, and we're going to start off with Mark for one minute each. So hi, I'm Mark Jarvis, CEO of uh, Giga Metals. Uh, We've got a giant deposit of uh, nickel and cobalt in north central British Columbia that we are developing. And uh, a similar model to you know, a copper porphyry type of deposit will be open pit, big volume. Uh, we're looking at uh, 35,000 tons a year of nickel uh, with associated cobalt. Um, and it's a very big challenge to develop a project like this. We are currently actively looking for strategic partners uh, to help us at the project level. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gordana Slepchev and I'm Chief Operating Officer of Lomico Metals. Uh, we have two major projects, Lalotor Graphite, which uh, we have published PEA last year, and we're looking to move that project into PFS. We actually have started today 18,000 meters drill program, as we're looking to uh, re-rate those resources from mostly inferred into measured and indicated. And also we have a Buria project, which is early stage lithium project, which we are actually working with Vincent, who is down the line, uh, on uh, with the gold spot and critical elements on really, uh, you know, creating some values uh, for us and identifying the targets for drilling later in the fall. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> my name is Chris Dornbos. I'm the CEO of E3 Metals. Uh, we're an Alberta-based lithium developer. We have a pretty significant resource here that produces very similar to oil and gas. It's an, action, uh, an acid that was discovered by Imperial in 1947 that we're repurposing from an old oil producer into a lithium producer. Um, we've developed a technology as well that enables us to extract the lithium from these brine resources um, using direct extraction methods so we don't have to use evaporation ponds. Uh, we've been developing this tech for the past five years. We're just about to pilot it uh, to develop our commercial first commercial processing facility of about plus minus 20,000 tons in, a, in the next four years and then grow from there. Um, Alberta has probably one of the, the biggest unknown resource bases in the, in the market because it's still nascent, it's still developing, but um, 30 million tons of lithium carbon equivalent in Alberta um, and of which we're developing um, a, a significant resource in the south end of it. So, very excited. Thanks for having me here. Hi, uh, Vincent Dubé Bourgeois, CEO of uh, Goldspot Discoveries. Uh, so, Goldspot, we're a bit different than the rest of the panel here. We are a technology company working in the mineral exploration space. Goldspot is just a name, but we, um, as Gordana said, we're working together to use artificial intelligence to help make better discoveries. So, working in the lithium space, uh, nickel deposit as well with uh, the majors um, or Global Energy Metal Corp in uh, Nevada for nickel projects. So, again, our idea is to use new tools, new technologies to to make better discoveries with the data sets we already have and are collecting. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're going to uh, move forward here and dive a little bit deeper to understand how these projects drive the energy transition forward. Starting with Gordana, can you tell us a bit more about your project and why development of projects like yours is important for Canada's future? Well, I believe everybody heard that there is commitment to move to about 50% of the electric vehicles uh, and 50% of the internal combustion vehicles by 2030. So how are we going to do it? Well, we need to build all these factories uh, that the uh, anode and cathode producing facilities and graphite is the main component, about 95% of the anode. Uh, you probably heard about many commitments uh, from the majors to build the factories in Quebec, in Ontario, and then there is a, a lot of capacity promised, over 750 gigawatts uh, in the next couple of the years in U.S. 
And if you look what's committed over there uh, from the majors and uh, you know junior exploration groups, that's going to be uh, creating a huge shortage in a couple of the years. So if I look in the next three or four years, we're going to see that significant shortage. So it is the right time to actually invest in the groups like Lumico or, or the groups that are producing lithium, nickel, cobalt, uh, you know, all, all the base metals that are the building blocks of the battery. So this is the right time. You know, if you invest in some of the juniors, you're going to see multiple returns, probably over 10, 10 times full, versus if you wait another three years, the return's not going to be as huge for the shareholders. So that's why it is important, actually, to support base metals and all the other critical minerals that are creating those electric batteries, because that's the future. Wonderful. Chris, you're up next. Yeah, maybe if you guys want more information about our project, ethermetalscorp.com, we're um, booth 701. Uh, maybe I can focus more on, on the, the industry and the drivers. If you look around um, the landscape right now, uh, two big things have happened in the last couple of years that are moving critical minerals forward and why there's such a rush towards them right now, especially lithium. Lithium is in every battery chemistry. About 10% of every battery is lithium. Um, but nickel, cobalt, those, um, the other metals, graphite, are very important as well. Um, the two big things that have shifted in the past couple of years is that the lithium ion battery has become the battery of choice for the automobile. So every EV is now building based, based on the uh, lithium ion platform and 2.2 terawatts of battery capacity being built, annual battery capacity being built in the world for lithium uh, batteries. The other big pivot that you've seen is the uh, automobile manufacturers, every single one of them have committed to electrifying their fleet in part and a lot of them in whole. And the two mean that to get those cars out, the, out of the line, to get batteries in those cars, you need critical minerals to develop them. You need sustainable critical minerals. That's one of the big pieces, especially for the way that they tax vehicles in Europe. So um, there's going to be a, uh, a lot of push, as we've talked about already, to move towards these critical minerals in the next uh, three to 10 years. All right, Vincent. Yeah, that's a very good point everyone brought here, but also we have to think about of how, how do we transfer the power that is generated to, to the vehicle. So electrification of vehicle is something that's happening and, and will keep hap happening. Um, but what will, what will happen also is we need to transfer all the power that those vehicles need um, throughout, throughout the planet. So to do that, copper is needed um, and other metals as well are, are needed. So the, the whole chain of electrification is prime for mining. And, and for that, we need to discover those deposit. And this is where Goldspot comes in, where we're able to, to go in and use our tools and AI, um, AI process that we developed to help every explorer in the world um, find more deposit and better, better deposit along the way. So you spend less dollars in exploration to find more deposit. And that's really the prime of, of what we should aim for. So electrifying the vehicles, electrifying the planet is something that needs to happen. We have about um, only 30% of Africa that's electrified right now. So this is a major step that will happen in the future. Wonderful. And Mark, take it home. Well, I am, you know, I think this whole uh, electric vehicle revolution has just blown everybody away. I mean, the way, how quickly it's happened. You know, people that two years ago were making predictions that other people thought were crazy turned out to be too conservative. The adoption of electric vehicles is just surprising everybody. And, you know, <laughs> there are supply chain issues. And I'm going to make a very bold prediction today. Um, 10 years from now, any automobile companies that have failed to vertically integrate back to the mine in the critical elements, lithium and nickel, uh, they're not going to be in the electric vehicle business. They're either going to be out of business or they will have a much smaller niche bit business in ICE vehicles. So everything's changing right now. And you know our project, which is a lot of heavy lifting to get it developed, I, I, I'm looking around and I'm just seeing lights are going on one by one as people realize, my God, I'm in trouble. If I build a gigafactory and I don't have my supply chain figured out, I'm gonna have a multi-billion dollar warehouse full of uh, you know, very expensive equipment and it's gonna be sitting idle. It's that 
critical, that existential, uh, I think, for the electric vehicle business. Wonderful. Excellent points made by everyone. And I think it's a really exciting time in the industry right now. I'm going to move us forward into a discussion about capital. The industry was really excited to see the announcement of $3.8 billion by the federal government committed to critical minerals. And I'm wondering where you all think we need to invest in the supply chain today to make sure that we have clean energy and low emitting mobility tomorrow. Chris, you're up first. Um, I mean, across the, the entire chain, I think, is where the money is needed. If you look at how they've broken it out, um, they have everything from processing development, processing technology development, all the way through to infrastructure. Um, I think that the money needs to come across Canada as well. A lot of these things end up being uh, held up in eastern Canada, and I think there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's a couple of us here on the western side of the world that have big projects, and I think, you know, looking at the landscape of the funds, uh, that type of, especially for uh, a, a company that's in development mode who has yet to make revenues or pre-revenue, and I think we're probably the three of us on the mineral side are, are all there, it, it's incredibly important uh, that if the minerals are in demand and they need to get out, that the government does support to some degree. Obviously, capital is important to find on your own, and, and you guys are all here looking for investments, and that's how companies like us raise capital. Um, but the non-elutive funding bolsters support. It demonstrates that someone other than uh, yourselves, so like the federal government, for example, has vetted the project, um, has uh, enabled it to proceed by providing capital, and then I think that helps out on all levels. So the junior explorers, all the way through the technology developers, uh, and into the point where you're building facilities and you need the big dollars to um, build a facility that's going to make the final product. Thank you, Chris. Vincent, what about you? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So again, uh, when we think of development in the supply chain, it's mostly the, the later half of it. It's when we exploit, when we transform the metals, but finding it is also very important. And this is where everybody in this conference is about, is trying to find a big deposit. Um, it's something that will happen, and all, all companies are looking towards it. So which one is the best deposit to, to go look for? This is where data comes in. So we have access to new data sets every day. New data is being produced from geophysical survey, geochemical analysis. Um, so how do you vet that your deposit is the right one? So people will come in, like Goldspot, where we come in with tools to help out companies one, explore the deposit, find the best target to go to go explore, but as well spend their, their dollars that are, as you mentioned, Chris, you finance your, your project, you dilute your company, but you need to spend it the best way possible. So this is where I think the government are forgetting the, the main part is, sure, we can explore the deposit, we can transform it into to something useful, but we first need to find it. Mark, you're up. Uh, well, in terms of the government money, you know, I suspect that the fix is in and it's all going to get spent in Ontario and Quebec. So uh, we're going to try and get some of it spent out here. In fact, we're working on that, but I know where the votes are. Um, but in terms of the larger question about how should this money be spent, you know, I mean, if you want to support the electric vehicle business, you need the mines, but you also need the refineries. And so there should be some kind of spoken wheel plan here where there are centralized refineries capable of producing, uh, you know, cathode-ready materials. Um, and that's not a trivial job. That's a big job. Um, and we're behind. I mean, the electric vehicle makers are going to bump into limits on supplies. They're already bumping into limits on supplies. It's happening right now. Um, I think uh, action on this is urgent if we're going to have an electric vehicle business in North America. I don't know whether we will or not. The jury's out. You're right. Those battery grade materials are critical. Gordana, you're up next. Well, uh, I believe my uh, colleague panelist uh, kind of pointed out very good uh, questions. Uh, the big one that nobody mentioned is uh, really the government has to expedite permitting and getting these projects online. You know, it takes three years to permit the project. If it's really critical, then it should be handled that way. So the the explorers of the groups that have good qualifying projects can get these permits sooner and they can get in production sooner. Because as you mentioned, you know, you're going to have all these factories. Where are you going to get the materials if the projects are still in the permitting stage? 
And something else that's really uh, you know hard for the junior miners, there is no institutional coverage for junior miners. So there's really minimal. It's all mostly retail. So it is hard for for the juniors to raise the funds and build the projects. It is uh, you know usually really hard project to do. I mean, we're all here trying to raise the money for our respective projects. So, you know, if the government really wants to, you know, have some impacts and all these big institutions have to come to the table, they have to do something, not just talk and say, oh, money's here. But then, you know, we have to move the timelines. How are we going to move it? We need the money and we need the government to support the permitting, make it faster. Absolutely right. I, I have to say, I'm in the in the mood for an EV, or in the mood and the market <laughs> for an EV right now, and I hope that my EV has uh, critical minerals from all of these projects here one day. Uh, okay, so that's all the time we have. I, I'd like to uh, thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, I'll leave you with one additional piece of information. BMAC has an ecosystem map that tracks all the companies in this space. It's a free resource on our website, bmacanada.com. I would encourage you to check it out and use it for whatever you need it for, maybe investing. Thanks, everybody, and thank you to our panelists.